Thanks to Bob for uh, introducing me today, and thanks to all of you to, to make it here today. It's great to see some familiar faces in the audience and some people who actually research and work with people with bipolar disorder. I had to do that second subtitle there to try and bring in more people around the first, second, and third ways, but I, I will actually cover that today too. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to, to provide a keynote here. It's not something that we take lightly because myself, so closely involved in the scientific committee, it's not something that we honestly put ourselves forward to, but uh, Ros and Philip and the scientific committee suggested that I put something together on bipolar disorder, so this is my summary, really, of our, of our work and where it's going. Okay. I just want to um, acknowledge uh, the ESRC grant called EROS, Emotion Regulation of Others and the Self, uh, which is a multi-site grant that supported some of the research I'm, I'm talking about here. On the last slide also, I had many of my collaborators who are involved in the work, and I'll be citing uh, as I go along. Okay, so what's the plan for this keynote? Um, we're going to talk about bipolar disorder and inspect what it really is. We're going to say a little bit about current CBT for bipolar disorder and its ethos. And then I'm going to shift our attention a little bit to CBT for anxiety disorders, because I'm going to put forward that we still have a lot to learn from this form of CBT in the field of bipolar. I'm then going to introduce our team's therapy and some of the evidence for the approach. And then I am going to say just a little bit about how I think that we should be working with clinical models that allow us to unite across these supposed three waves of CBT rather than drawing out somewhat uh, tortured distinctions between them. Um, and I'm also just going to say something quite new about the potential neuroscience of bipolar disorder that is really speculative, but I just would like to share some of my ideas with you. So that's the plan, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, I'm, I'm, I use this quote a lot in my teaching, in my clinical workshops, uh, and I'm going to read it out to you because I think it really illustrates what mania is. When you are high, it is tremendous. Shyness goes, the right words and gestures are suddenly there. The power to seduce and captivate others are felt certainty. Feelings of ease, intensity, power, well-being, financial omnipotence and euphoria now pervade one's marrow. But somehow this changes. The fast ideas are far too fast and there's far too many. Overwhelming confusion replaced by fear and concern. You're irritable, angry, frightened, uncomfortable and enmeshed totally in the blackest caves of mind. It goes on and on, and finally there are only other people's recollections of your behaviour, your bizarre, frenetic, aimless behaviour. Now, this is a first-person account in a, 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 a large tome on, on bipolar disorder. I think it illustrates the lived experience of a manic episode very neatly. It illustrates both the extreme positive and negative emotions. It illustrates some points at which things seem to be absolutely right and certain and, uh, and refined and in control, and other points that seem to descend into complete chaos and loss of control. And I think really if we want to understand bipolar disorder, we need to understand mania and all these different components and experiences and how they pan out. So now I'm going to just touch on what is bipolar disorder. A person with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder will have had at least seven days of those kinds of symptoms I'm explaining to the degree they've got involved in so many risky uh, activities um, that uh, they may need uh, in increased medication, they may well have to go into psych psychiatric hospital. Um, so mania is therefore classed as a, a severe uh, mental health episode. What's interesting is that hypermania includes exactly the same symptoms diagnostically as mania, but they only need to go on for four days or more, and the impact on functioning is by no, no, nowhere near as disabling as in mania. Some people actually improve their functioning during hypermania. So we need to understand what on earth is, is this distinction going on between two things that on the surface of their phenomenology are, are very similar. The other thing I think we need to think about about bipolar disorder is it's defined historically by what episodes you've had. So by the book, you can't ever recover from bipolar disorder because it's historic. 
is that really the way we want to go in how we define mental health problems? And this led to a working group I was involved with for the British Psychological Society, with Steve Jones at the helm, looking at bipolar disorder, looking at multiple perspectives from service users, psychiatrists, and all the research that's out there. And we found that, yes, there is evidence that many people have a severe and enduring condition. Other people make pathways to enduring or recurrent periods of recovery. And actually, some people identify all kinds of positive aspects from their experiences too. So what we actually see is a rich tapestry of experience, including severity, but also including hope, I believe, as well. And it's a, I very much recommend this document that you can download to, to look at this uh, BPS uh, opinion piece on, on bipolar disorder. There was also a critique of it, that, which we then answered in the, in the journal called The Psychiatrist. So that's what bipolar disorder is. It's obviously, we're not going into detail, but that, I hope that's enough for us to get moving on things. Given that context, I guess it's hardly surprising as to how CBT has evolved for bipolar disorder. Now, there are many manuals on bipolar disorder, and Bob's been involved in, in, um, in one of these. I think it's fair to say that to date, CBT for bipolar disorder has had a psychoeducational emphasis explaining the nature of this uh, illness and its recurrence and the need for medication very often. Often the CBT is focused on the past, drawing timelines or on the future to try and prevent relapse. And it's quite uh, a key part of it is about relapse prevention, trying to identify warning signs so that relapsing episodes uh, are minimised. And I think that angle has a, an assumption behind it that bipolar disorder is a lifelong illness. And I'm going to come back to that biological evidence and look at it in a different way. Um, the good thing about CBT for bipolar disorder to date is that it does work. The effect sizes are moderate and not as, uh, as impressive as what we see in many other mental health problems. Um, I've, I've somewhat characterised the CBT for, uh, up to now. But there is often a focus on uh, identifying negative automatic thoughts and bringing in a kind of more Beckian approach to dealing with depression. But the, the bit that's unique often in these manuals is around relapse prevention of mania in the way that I described. And I guess what I'd like us to do is take a look at that and then compare it to the cutting edge CBT for anxiety disorders, which actually has been around for uh, probably approaching 20 years now in terms of the RCTs. There's very much an emphasis in CBT for anxiety on our principle of collaborative empiricism. We work together with our clients to try and understand things and test things out without actually necessarily telling them the way things are. A lot of our techniques are focused on the present moment experiences of arousal and bodily sensations and emotions and imagery and testing those out right now with experiments to either uh, often to disconfirm beliefs, many of which are around catastrophes that are going to happen. It's about facing feelings rather than trying to avoid them or prevent them happening. There's also a real angle on reclaiming one's life, such as the work in, in uh, uh, PTSD. And the early work on these CBTs directly questioned the biological assumptions of the time. And David Clark's landmark article on panic disorder tackled directly a biological assumption that panic disorder was caused by a brain lesion uh, rather than a cognitive mechanism. And this CBT is much more effective than what we currently have for, for bipolar disorder. Now, I'm not saying all these things add up to that, but I'm, I'm interested in that difference. I'm interested in why we're maybe not doing this kind of work with people with bipolar disorder. Maybe one reason, and Steve Jones was talking about this earlier today, is that clinicians haven't realised how important anxiety is in people with bipolar disorder. And Steve said he talked to clinicians who said it's not important. He talked to the service users, and they said it's one of the most important things to us in coping with this worry, panic, and anxiety. And this is what the evidence reflects as well. We find that anxiety disorders are highly prevalent in people with bipolar disorder. We could see, really, that this, this dysregulation in we, what, that we see in bipolar disorder, maybe it's a dysregulation of other affects as well, because we certainly see um, disruptions in, in irritability and anger as well as high and low moods. Interestingly, these relapse prevention studies and interventions are driven by 
the clients and the clinicians fear and worry about relapse. We also know that there's pervasive negative affect. Even when people are apparently well outside episodes, they're still reporting elevated anxiety and, and low mood. And in mania, if you actually look at over uh, eight of these studies now, analyzing the components, the phenomenology of a manic episode, actually neg negative affect is at least as significant as a positive affect in mania. And it, you, can, you can identify these as a sort of cluster of dysphoria, panic, worry, paranoia, and hostility in, in several different factor ana analytic studies. So to me, this is pretty good evidence that we ought to be thinking about anxiety in people with bipolar disorder. But if we are, and we're doing a cognitive approach, does that mean that we're going to be focusing on catastrophic appraisals? Because that's what all these successful approaches for CBT for anxiety to, to do. And I think there's an initial reservation in thinking about that because all our intuition is telling us that people with bipolar disorder have got overly positive thinking, not overly negative thinking. Um, and I guess what I'm going to do with you now is share a bit of evidence with you that that assumption is possibly mistaken. So I'm going to, this is a study where we um, included not only uh, positive appraisals, but catastrophic and appraisals about other people's negativity and criticism and tendency to control. So we developed a questionnaire where we, there's a series of items that ask about how people appraise their high mood states. This can be um, positive mood, it can be high arousal, it can be high activity. What, are people, what sense do people make of those? And we wanted to do a robust study where we compared different kinds of uh, clinical groups with control groups. We had a group of people who'd recently relapsed with bipolar disorder, so presumably these are the people where these cognitions are, are very active. We had a group of people who had remained well from uh, episodes for an average 10 years. So arguably they were uh, in, a, in a zone of recovery from bipolar disorder. We had a group of people with uh, a history of unipolar depressed episodes. And then we had two non-clinical groups. We had a, a conventional clin non-clinical group. But then we also sought out a group of people who were non-clinical because they'd never sought psychological treatment, didn't have any uh, DSM-4 disorders, um, and were functioning well. Um, but they'd actually experienced diagnosable hypermanic episodes. And if you remember, a hypermanic episode doesn't require significant distress and dysfunction. So it's possible to have a hypermanic episode and not seek treatment. Uh, these are people who are all over 30, which is beyond the peak age of onset of bipolar disorder. We might argue they're going to develop it when they're 40 or 50, but at least statistically, it's unlikely in, in, in the majority of this group. And I guess we, this is a particularly interesting group because these people are getting high moods, but for some reason, it's not having the impact on functioning that uh, it is having for the people with bipolar disorder. So I'm going to extract two sets of appraisals here. First, looking at success appraisals, such as, when I feel good, I'm sure everything will work out perfectly. And we find that these appraisals are elevated in people with bipolar disorder. But if you look at this non-clinical hypermanic group, they're higher than our recovered bipolar group, although not significantly, but in the same range as the people with uh, ongoing bipolar disorder. So these positive appraisals in this study are not discriminating between people with bipolar disorder and people who have high moods that are known to be hypermanic, but there's no impact on functioning. Interestingly, we do get the effect on uh, when we look at differences between a pure non-clinical group. So it's not as though it's not as though people with bipolar disorder don't have over positive thinking. It's just that it may not be elevated compared to people that we match on this uh, tendency to for hypermanic experiences. On the other hand, when we look at catastrophic appraisals, such as when I feel agitated and restless, it means I'm about to have a breakdown, we find that the people with relapsed bipolar disorder, and actually if you average the bipolar disorder group, they are significantly higher now than our non-clinical hypermanic group um, in, the, in this study. So we're finding that these catastrophic appraisals are actually starting to distinguish our bipolar group from uh, what, I think, what I think is an appropriate control group. 
So in summary, the positive appraisals aren't differentiating bipolar disorder from uh, unipolar depression or, or non-clinical uh, hypomanic uh, group. We're finding that catastrophic appraisals are differentiating. And really encouragingly, we found that two independent groups have replicated these findings around the negative and catastrophic appraisals. So one of these studies found that it was higher in people with bipolar disorder than both unipolar depression and controls, and the other just compared it to controls. But we found, again, this replication twice of the negative appraisals, the catastrophic ones, being what discriminates people. Let's have another look at this, and let's have another look and see what these positive appraisals are really doing, because they are there. What are they doing? Are they interacting in some way with the negative ones? And this is converging on our, on our model. What I think a, a, a negative or catastrophic appraisal of a positive mood means is it implies some kind of interference or conflict. Because if you're thinking really bad things about what is really a, a desirable mood state, surely to, that implies some, some internal struggle or, or conflict. But we're interested in that and we're going to really, really test this out more robustly. So this is a, a paper where we combine several data sets and coded the positive and negative appraisals um, distinctively and got into rate of reliability on that. Because most studies have either compared one or the other, and even the study I told you about didn't statistically control for the separate contribution of positive and negative. So in this study, we're actually seeing what is it that discriminates someone with bipolar disorder from unipolar depression and controls? Is it having more positive appraisals? Is it having more negative appraisals? Or is it having a combination of both positive and negative appraisals about the same mood state? And that actually, that final hypothesis is actually the one that is most strongly uh, leads on from our, our model, which I'll, I'll explain to you. This is um, the data that we found, which uh, Rebecca Kelly analysed. The first thing I'd like you to, to notice about this is that the dotted line is higher than the unbroken line. What this shows us is that people who have uh, more, than, uh, one, more than one standard deviation from the mean in their negative appraisals, they are more likely to have bipolar disorder in this sample than the people that are lower than one standard deviation from the mean in terms of their negative appraisals. The dotted line is higher than the, uh, the unbroken line. What we also see is an interaction effect because both of these graphs are going in the opposite direction. In the people with high levels of negative appraisals, the more positive appraisals they have of the same high feelings, the more likely they are in our study to have bipolar disorder. Up to a point at which, if they're over the median, about 95% of people out of this sample of around 200 or so people have got bipolar disorder. And if you look at, but if you look at the flip side and positive appraisals in the ab absence of negative appraisals, you see the opposite direction going on. The more positive appraisals you have in the absence of negative appraisals, the less likely you are of having bipolar disorder. They actually seem to have a protective effect, potentially. And to me, this makes sense in that that's what makes it so alluring to want to believe positive things about being high mood. It actually can have a... Uh, a good effect. It may, be, may you make, make you more, resi more resilient. The only problem is, if for some reason, a trauma, a hospital admission, uh, a, a, a difficult interpersonal relationship, something suddenly makes you believe the negative and catastrophic things about the same feelings, you suddenly flip to the other, the other line on this graph. And suddenly the thing that is protecting you becomes a thing that is damaging you. That's, that's our our sort of way of explaining this kind of process, and I'll, I'll explain to you why, how it relates to the, to, the, to the model in a moment. But we, we thought we'd get some kind of interaction, but we did not predict we'd get it quite so stark as this. But it's obviously um, a tempting and important question to ask whether these catastrophic appraisals are just epiphenomenon. If you've, if you've had a, bipo a mental illness, you're just going to believe more bad things. Maybe they have no effect on actual symptoms. So it was a really important study that Alison Dodd led where she recruited 50 people with bipolar disorder and measured a whole load of baseline clinical measures um, and uh, she also measured a, a self-report measure of the proposed biological propensity 
to high mood, reward sensitivity, and these positive negative appraisals. And then she simply, and it's a, an early study, this followed people up after four weeks and measured their mood swings and their functioning. We didn't do uh, follow-up relapse. Uh, that would be the subject of a future study. The first thing that was interesting about this is that differences in reward sensitivity didn't predict symptoms at four weeks. We did find that clinical variables predicted functioning. So if you had more episodes and it was less time since your last episode, you had poorer functioning, which kind of makes sense. But I guess we want to know what do the appraisals predict when we account for this statistical prediction of the clinical characteristics. And you can see we've got quite a few things in here that we're, that we're uh, covariant for. In this paper, we found that our appraisals as a total score, which is bringing the positive and negative together, predicted symptoms of activation, which is like uh, thoughts racing, uh, symptoms of conflict, such as um, irritability. When we controlled for baseline symptoms, when, when these appraisals were measured, and we controlled for the predictive clinical variables. So we're finding the kind of predictive effect of appraisals that you would just see and expect to see in something like panic disorder or PTSD. It's the same kind of methodology. The other thing I'd like to help you focus your attention on is the, the extent to which our positive and negative appraisals predict important outcomes. And I'm focusing on this box here where I'm contrasting a positive appraisal which is actually related to having less depression and better functioning after four weeks, and a negative appraisal, which is predicting having more depression and poorer functioning after four weeks. So we're getting the same kind of pattern that we saw in that cross-sectional data, where the, the positive negative appraisals are actually predicting, predicting opposing pathways. Um, but if you have both of them, as measured by our total scale, then you get um, prediction of, of symptoms too. And we've got other uh, studies. We looked at, we've looked at predictive windows over four days and three months in subclinical populations. We've also got uh, computer paradigms. We're interested in how people appraise others when they're in a high mood. And we find that when you put people with, in bipolar disorder in a good mood, they actually reject advice and suggestions uh, from other people in a, in a computer paradigm uh, compared to people with unipolar depression. So there's something about the negativity of the other that seems to be coming coming into play here. Um, we also find in qualitative studies that it seems important for people to genuinely direct attention to, to their own needs and to question this kind of self-critical thinking they've got into the habit of, of doing. And our clinical intervention involves identifying and formulating this self-criticism. And in other areas in, in the US, they've looked at a phenomenon called dampening of positive affect. And this predicts depression and is elevated in bipolar disorder. And dampening positive affect is basically trying to suppress and push down positive mood states. So in summary, what, we're, or what I'm trying to put across here is that we can measure negative appraisals of high moods. They include fear of loss of control, fear of catastrophes, fear of extreme criticism. That actually, these negative appraisals may be confounding studies on positive appraisals in the past. And if you include both of them in, the negative appraisals come out and uh, predict mood symptoms better than the positive appraisals. But there's particularly some kind of synergy between the two, that if you have both, that's particularly uh, caustic, i.e. when they conflict with each other. And this is what initially drove our uh, cognitive model. It's quite simple, really, the essence of this. We have a feeling... We either have extreme positive beliefs about this, which lead us to try and get more of that feeling, or we have extreme negative beliefs, beliefs about it, which lead us to try and have less of that feeling. And the idea is we all have these conflicting feel, uh, sort of uh, goals around our feelings, but just with people with more mood swings, these are just more extreme and more poorly integrated with each other. And we propose that it's an unstable strategy to have conflicting goals, and that's what leads to mood swings. And Bob mentioned our work on the transdiagnostic approach. Our model of bipolar disorder is really a model of mood swings across disorders. But we just think the people who get the, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder are the most uh, mm -hmm. archetypal version of, uh, of where mood swings are a problem. Another way of looking at this is, uh, again, Bob was talking about our metaphors book, thinking about the metaphor of Icarus. And Icarus 
had wings that were glued uh, to him as he was flying to escape from the labyrinth at Minos. He had to fly high enough above the water so that his uh, feathers didn't get wet, and he had to fly low enough below the sun so that it, the wax didn't melt. So there were potential fears, if you like, of going too high or too low. And it's our proposal that, that patients try and keep themselves in quite a restricted bandwidth of internal state, and that's part of the challenge. Our challenge is to help them broaden that bandwidth and tolerate accept, and accept a wider range of, of moods. And do that in the service of goals they have in their life that are not mood dependent necessarily. So this leads us on to our therapy, think effectively about mood swings. We would say that this CBT is closer to what we appreciate in CBT for anxiety disorders than it is to earlier CBTs for bipolar. Part of that reason is because we, uh, we target current problems like anxiety, but also depression and, and mood swings. We're not so interested in relapse prevention, but we would hope that our therapy would have an impact on relapse prevention. We maintain this collaborative empiricism. We're particularly interested in helping people sustain attention to internal states, images and thoughts that they might not otherwise sustain attention to. And we largely use questioning around feelings, both in the, in the therapy situation and in key problem situations, to achieve this. We also explore metaphors in the mind's eye to achieve this. We then so help the clients spell out what their positive and negative appraisals are and the goals associated with those, and we may draw cycles together to understand it. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is help them rise above these cycles they get stuck in and just get on with their lives despite the changes of their moods. And in doing so, we hope that people are recognising a sense of self that isn't so tied up and caught up in these compartmentalised mood states, transcends these and helps regulate and balance them. And clients have different ways of talking about this. It's the real me. It's the healthy self. Um, and we do this to enhance their recovery and, and, and quality of life. And we do this rather than trying to make them hypervigilant to warning signs to prevent relapse. Because we think it's better to have a target to head towards rather than something that is very scary you don't understand to head away from and you're not sure where to go to escape it. We also have a pyramid of therapy principles that we use to guide our therapy. Um, we feel, as in any clinical intervention in this, in this group, it's important to uh, focus on safety and risk. In a safe enough environment, a client can start to engage with us and, uh, and answer our questions. If they're engaging with us, we can start to ask them about their personal phenomenological experiences. If we can start to get a handle of those, those thoughts and feelings and images as they come up, we can start to formulate and start to build links with the client. And if we can start to do that, we can start to suggest ways they might want to change it or, or, or tackle it differently. So it's a very graded and gentle approach to the, to the change uh, process. This is the point where I, hopefully bells have been ticking as you've... Bells have been ticking? Bells have been ringing as you've been going through. That I've been mixing and matching my terminology here. Part of that reason is because we have a theory behind the work that we do that isn't restricted to, 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 to particular terms. Um, but I think what that does is it allows us to be quite fluid in how we engage therapists. Because we think it's just as important to help clinicians work with the skills and the principles that they're comfortable with as it is for clients. And so we will meet clients with whatever wave of CBT or other therapy they're, 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 they know and we'll show them how our model can fit in on this basis. Because our model involves exposure to mood states a person might otherwise uh, avoid. That's a basic first, first wave behaviour therapy. Because it involves helping clients to question their thinking first wave cognitive therapy, because it can involve modelling that vicious cycle between thoughts, feelings and behaviours and doing behavioural experiments like second wave CBT, and because if you took this at a more uh, philosophical level, it's often about cultivating an acceptance and an awareness of these mood states by, um, while pursuing chosen values, and because it also involves understanding conflict, sometimes conflicting side of the self, and helping people to monitor these and potentially integrate them um, 
in their psyche. There you go, I've used a word that's even more uh, uh, cross discipline So I think that we don't need to create artificial boundaries across these different waves. I think that if you've got a model, that the working components of it are, are, are correct, I'm, I'm pausing, there's a disruption in my speech, I was talking about that earlier, are, are accurate, then we can be more fluid about these kind of terms that we use. And, we, and I think that really empowers clinicians. Okay, what sort of kind of effects are we having on how we're studying this? Um, we did a um, case study that uh, Ruth Searson was a therapist with this, and she worked with seven people with bipolar disorder, and we assessed a whole cluster of things. What was really positive about this and allows us to pursue it further is that um, the clients that Ruth saw uh, had a really nice impact on their depression, uh, the effect size of 3.2, which is up there with some of those big effect sizes we saw in the, in the, well, ran, in the well studied CBT. Now, bearing in mind that case studies always get inflated effect sizes, it's probably important to be in those high ranges because really the effect size in RCT is going to be more challenging. And we were encouraged to see that the effect size for other facets, the mood swings, the functioning, and our mechanism, our conflicting appraisals, also change with the therapy. So that's led us um, to uh, nicely, we've got some funding from the NIHR to do a pilot randomized control trial where we're comparing our team's therapy with, uh, with uh, tr well, our team's therapy plus treatment as usual, with treatment as usual, and we've got a 12 month and hopefully an 18 month follow up for that. And if you are, any of you in the Greater Manchester region, several trusts are running this, and the website says more about the, the study and the, and the therapy as well. So we're really hopeful that we're going to get at least some decent effect sizes um, from this. Okay, so I just want to say maybe a, a couple of other new things now. What does team say about this? known biological vulnerability to bipolar disorder. And I think in a related question, what goes on in the brain doing therapy? I don't have any evidence to share with you, but I have plenty of theory. Um, and I think I've sort of hopefully answered uh, in some ways how we apply it to different therapies, but we can come back to that maybe if there's questions. Now, what we think is going on when um, clients are thinking they're positive things or thinking they're negative things about their mood is they're stuck with their awareness on one side of this at a time. And you probably all know clients who really mostly only think of the good things about being high or mostly think of the bad things. So awareness seems to be stuck on one side at any one point. Either I've got to express these feelings and, and, and pursue all my goals and remove all the depression, or I've got to suppress these high moods and restrict myself, take more medication, I've got socially withdraw, I've got to tell myself I'm stupid for doing all these things. We, we would propose that awareness is on one or other of these most of the time. And if awareness is on there, change is only going to happen in one or other of these at any one time. It's like you're, you've got a tug of war happening and you can only go over to one team at a time and say, try harder. And then you go back to the other side and say, try harder. But you're not talking to both teams and saying, do you guys really need to be pulling this rope and, you know, what's going on here? Is it, you know, is it working for you? So what I think that we do in therapy, and I don't think our team's therapy or indeed many other therapies uh, share this, this maybe explicitly or implicitly, is we help people see both sides of things. We help people see the way they're pulling at themselves in opposing ways. So I think what we do, therefore, is we go, if you like, to a level above and help regulate these two systems. And we do that through help people, helping people sustain attention on them, considering their goals around them, uh, reflecting on it and broadening their perspectives. Really nice uh, keynote from uh, Tim Dalgleish uh, earlier in this conference talking about broadening perspectives. And I think we, we, we converge on, on this kind of thing. Now, is there anything within neuroscience that is, is relevant to this? Well, some of you, or many of you will know Jeffrey Gray's early work on the neuropsychology of anxiety. Actually, he updated it with Norton in 2000 to focus and uh, focus what they called a behavioral inhibition system at the time, which was associated with anxiety at the time, 
to maybe see a much more functional role of this. Essentially, what they, they, they uh, had, had proposed, and uh, unfortunately, Jeffrey Gray is no longer with us, but what they proposed at the end here is that for any possible um, current goal, you can either approach it and go near it, or you can avoid it and go further away from it. And they called this goal conflict. And they reconceptualized traditional threat avoidance and reward um, seeking uh, behavior in this, in this way. And for them, avoiding a threat is, is equivalent to um, uh, frustrative non-reward, because they both involve the same uh, direction. And they proposed that there's a system called the behavioral inhibition system that regulates and manages this goal conflict. And Liam Mason, working with uh, Sarah Tai, Richard Bentle and colleagues, are moving towards this way of looking at the biology of um, bipolar disorder. We do know that attention flits and uh, is much, much less uh, well sustained in people with bipolar disorder, even outside an episode. This is one of the most robust neuropsychological findings within bipolar disorder. So if our intervention is helping sustain attention, we would argue, therefore, we're, we're targeting an active ingredient. But I think there's still a question that's right, that's left, even once we've bung in this uh, neuroscience. How do we account for this real loss of control and chaotic experience during mania? Is it just this, uh, this to in and fro like you get in a, in a tug of war, this goal conflict? What happens when two systems are trying to control something and they're fighting with each other over it. And to, to understand this, we, we tend to go to the, the, more, the more fundamental basis of our theory, looking at how control and goals actually work. And this is a theory called perceptual control theory. It's been around a long time. and got a website there that says a lot more about it. But the basic premise of it is very simple. We perceive some kind of mood state or some kind of other perception, like a low mood. We compare it to the mood that we want to have. We measure that discrepancy or error, and the greater that error is, the more effort and action we put in to doing something to, re to reduce that discrepancy. It's like the, the one side of the tug of, tug of war pulling harder. We have to be tugging at something. We control something in our environment to do so, so someone who seeks stimulation has to find a social environment to do so, and in doing that, they raise their mood up but there may be things that disturb them and get in the way of them achieving that, like their chronic tiredness within them, or maybe concerned family members. So we would argue that when these appraisals are playing their way out on a person's mood, it's operating in this perceive, compare, act kind of way, where the person's perceiving, comparing, and, and uh, acting on it. Now these systems, I might add, also are automated. They're not, they don't rely on conscious awareness, um, and I guess, that's why, again, it's fruitful to use this theory because it's based on a, on, um, a more uh, basic systems approach. So, so that's when one of these goals is working. We perceive what we want, we compare it, we act um, to, to uh, reduce this discrepancy and get the thing that we want. Now, when we don't get what we want, we try harder. Okay? Trying harder in a control system is called the game. And this is why in a control system in an amplifier that you'll be familiar with is called a gain because it's made up of the base, same basic components. Your gain is your error sensitivity. It amplifies this felt sense of things not being right to, to, to provide action in the real world. So the greater your gain or the error sensitivity, the more effort and activity you're going to put into doing something. Now, it's very interesting. You can model what gain does when you enhance it. And this is some work by uh, Kent McClelland, who's a social psychologist, but models uh, interactions between, between individuals uh, by creating these little control systems on a computer and modeling them. Now, if you increase the gain of a control system, you get, you get your goals met quicker, and you get a, 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 a lesser uh, error and a much tighter fit to what you want. So in this example, the red line is what you want. That's the mood that you want. The orange line is what your mood is. If you, if you ramp up the gain of any, anything you're controlling, you get, it, get there quicker and you get it tighter. 
That sounds brilliant. It also sounds to me like what some of these people in hypermania are telling us. You know, I'm fast, I'm quick, I can do everything faster. And many of their colleagues and friends would agree they're much more witty and funny and they get more work done when they're, when they're doing this. So maybe what's going on is they're getting more sensitive to error, they're getting more, um, more gain in these systems. Um, the problem is, if you keep on ramping up the gain of any of these systems, you get an overshoot. Now, when you hit, and, it, and it's very interesting because you meet a tipping point. Just at this game in this model, this computer model, 155, you get back to normal again, you restabilize. Just when you get over 160, which is not too far from the one where you've managed to just get stability again, it goes, it looms out of control and reaches a, a chaotic state. And going right back to that quote by Goodwin and Jameson, I think that's what, what they're telling us that suddenly it all goes out of control and you didn't see it happening and you just thought you were doing everything better. And so I think that's when we actually look at these different components of control, we start to understand more about bipolar disorder that starts to explain, explain the phenomenology and the biology a little bit better. So what are we, so, so how does this look? It's the idea is that the person is stuck on one of these goals, they're driving them harder, increasing the gain, but that is just going to cre increase the conflict because both sides are working against each other. And so therefore, we need to, to, to synthesize that, which I'll come back into a minute. But in terms of how, what this looks like, in terms of symptoms, what, what I'm putting across here is that during this phase that we're often working with in therapy, where people have got these subclinical symptoms of anxiety and worry and low levels of depression, that life is compromised for them. They're not getting what they want. And we propose this is because they've got conflict, conflicts in their goals and the ways they're trying to control things. And so an opportunity arises. Something happens in their life, which we might call a trigger event, but really it's an opportunity to up your game. The circus comes to town, a new job comes up, a new relationship flowers. So you hype up one of these sides. But it reaches this tipping point and that leads to a loss of control experience, which really is not within what we traditionally describe as the cognitive domain. This is, this is your brain systems going into a very uh, unusual state of mind. And because of that, we often have to resort to quite extreme attempts like hospital admissions and medication to try and restore normality. But maybe what they do is they, they drastically ramp down the gain again, so that the person now becomes very insensitive to error and less effortful in their behaviour. And maybe that's what, partly what we see when we see depression and loss of interest and maybe even other health problems. Of course, this isn't a linear thing. People are going to and fro from these different states. And so maybe what we should be doing, and I hope this is what Teams really is doing in the brain when we're working with people, is we're helping people to see both sides of these, uh, these systems. Um, and they're looking at them together and they're realising that they're conflicting and they're looking at the reasons, the deeper reasons behind why they've got them, the deeper goals that they have in life, they're sustaining attention on the impacts for them in terms of their imagery and their experience and that is helping them to manage and resolve these conflicting goals in a more adaptive way. Uh, there's some interesting studies, I talked about uh, Liam Mason's work, uh, it's unpublished, there's a nice published study about traditional cognitive therapy and looking at how it may be involved in a sort of prefrontal process that's involved in, uh, in other studies we know to be managing uh, attentional conflict. So, come to my last slide, so this is nice, hopefully I have a little bit of time for questions. I started by suggesting to you that we really need to think about negative, self-critical and catastrophic um, appraisals in people with bipolar disorder and this may be what's more important to target. We, don't, we, we also explore the positive appraisals with people and we look at this, this conflict that's going on but in a way it, it, um, it's interesting in this research how strong this, this negative side are so we, we, we really focus on them when they arise in the therapy that, that we do. And we don't think this is particularly surprising if you're doing CBT for anxiety disorders. It only seems unusual because of our assumptions about what bipolar disorder is. 
but actually half of people with bipolar disorder have got an anxiety disorder. We've, we've put it across this view that it's important to model conflicting goals of people, both in therapy, but also in our theories and how we understand brain processing. Um, hopefully I've shared with you what you see to be some uh, emerging empirical support for our theory and also uh, for our therapy. And we have the RCT in progress, which will help us get more confident to look at a larger multi-site uh, non-pilot RCT. I think what I was saying in terms of bringing in control theory was a couple of things. One thing I think it does is it replaces what is often a static medical model of um, bipolar or psychopathology with a dynamic control model that's just as biological, I believe, as our medical models, but it's dynamic and changeable and it really helps us understand what the brain is actually doing. And I don't think that should have any um, uh, closer link to any particular wave of CBT than, than any other one. Um, I think also what we're doing is we're shifting from a way of doing CBT that sometimes seems to be about planning behaviours to prevent future relapse to one where we're facilitating a mindset that promotes effective decision-making under uncertainty that thereby aids recovery. Um, and that's what we're, we're hopefully heading towards. And I think, again, such an approach actually reveals the commonalities across the different waves of the past, present and future waves of CBT rather than the differences. So thank you for your time.